thank the ICR for inviting me and thank you for coming to listen. I'm going to take you on a little trip. Once upon a time, there was a group of animal stories that traveled all over the globe. They crossed the deepest oceans, the driest deserts, the highest mountains. <coughs> For over 2,000 years, these animal stories journeyed from their birthplace in India, which is what the map is, at the time of the Buddha, until they reached the shores of England at the time of Shakespeare. They traveled under many names, and they took many forms. One name in Arabic was the title Khalila Wadimna, another in English, the fables of Bidpai, and also in English, an unsung Renaissance masterpiece called The Moral Philosophy of Doni, translated by Sir Thomas North in 1570. In their childhood, these animal stories found their voice in the oral tradition of the ancient storytellers. Our own Richard the Lionhearted is recorded as often telling one of these stories after his return from the Crusades. Now in their adolescence, these stories became precious handcrafted manuscripts created by scribes, calligraphers, illustrators, and artists. And in their maturity, they turned into printed books. It has been said that these animal stories are traveled more widely than the Bible. As manuscripts or books, over 200 versions exist in 50 different languages. And these animal stories are alive and kicking today after 2,000 years. My purpose this afternoon is to give you a bird's eye view in five easy stages of their incredible journey, starting at the time of the Buddha in India and ending up here in England in 1570. It's a journey that takes 2,000 years, so we better get cracking. Uh, this is the abbreviated pedigree from 1888. Uh, the full pedigree is daunting, uh, but this is the abbreviated one, which is in my, in my recent publication of this book. And what you can see is uh, these, these colored bits are the five stages of the journey. So we start up at the left, what Robert Irwin mentioned, the Jataka tales. Then we go to the Sanskrit, then we go to the Pavlavi, and the Arabic is the turquoise dot of Ibn Makafa. And then we're going to skip down to 1570, the time of Shakespeare, the moral philosophy of Donna. The first thing you notice is, therefore, is that it has many names. In India, this book is called the Panchatantra. In Old Persian, or Pavlevi, it was called the Kariak ud Damanak. And Khalila and Dimna is the famous Arabic title. The, famous, the fables of Bidpai is one of its European aliases. But again, I refer to Sir Thomas North's edition. Now we're going to focus on the five easy stages of the Khalila Dimna. So let's begin at the beginning, which is 450 BC, halfway through the lifetime of the historical Buddha, the Jataka tales. The Jataka tales from India are one of the largest and oldest collections of stories in the world. Let's see if we can get Mr. Buddha up. There he is. 2,500 years ago, at approximately 430 BC, the teenage Prince Siddhartha left his family palace in North India, abandoning the trappings of royalty, the grandiose luxury into which he was born. He went in search of reality, of the true life lived by ordinary humans and creatures. And we are told at the age of 35, he becomes the enlightened Buddha and begins to teach his disciples. Now, one of the ways he teaches his disciples is by the use of animal stories, which he tells them. This is not necessarily a definite photograph of that event, but it is, you know, I don't know, Selene's reconstruction of him talking. It was the only thing I could find which had decent quality on the internet. So these concepts that he's talking about, these animal stories are related to reincarnation and rebirth in his structure. And the concepts of reincarnation and rebirth were already very widespread in India before Prince Siddhartha's birth. The animal tales the Buddha tells his disciples reflect his years of deep meditation and aesthetic practice. They contain, incredible to most of us, the Buddha's memories of his past lives from the seeming endless cycle of birth and death. In all, 
There are 547 such animal stories, and they're called, as I say, the Jataka tales or the Buddhist birth tales. In them, the Buddha recounts the cycles of his previous lives in a multitude of forms. He is monkey, fish, elephant, house, horse, mouse, tree, spirit, serpent, king, merchant, cook, warrior, archer, musician, scavenger, brahmin, minister, king, and so on, and so on, and so on, for hundreds of stories. As I say, all 547 of these stories have only ever been translated into a Western language once in the 19th century. And it's six volumes. You can get a very good Penguin edition now. Uh, it's about that thick. That's 26 stories. That's about 5%. So if you imagine, it's five, 470 pages. I mean, so if you imagine you were going to have a whole lot, it's gonna, you're going to read 5,000 pages just like this. And I don't know anybody's ever done it. Uh, I hope I do someday, because they're amazing, some of these stories, but their, their structure is not quite what we're, what we're used to. It does take a sort of mindset, which I can sometimes find, to get back into this stuff. Anyway, these animal Buddha stories, he adapted them from earlier folk tales about animals. Because it seems that there is no race or nation that has not used beast fables as part of its heritage, of instructional material. The genre is as ancient as mankind himself, dating back to our days as primitive hunter-gatherers, chanting magical uh, incantations deep in caves, which are lit with flickering torchlight revealing wall paintings. We know that this happened. Uh, well, we know that there were wall paintings there. We don't have a, <clears throat> a YouTube video of what was going on there. But people speculate that 25,000 year, 25, years ago, we practiced mumbo-jumbo in caves to work ourselves up before going out to hunt. And some anthropologists claim that such animal magic helped Homo sapiens sapiens survive till today. That's kind of what I'm talking about, that this goes way back as far as we can imagine. <laughs> In our, in our cultural history or our genealogical history. Sir Richard Burton, and more about him later, suggested that man's use of the beast fable commemorates our instinctive knowledge of how we emerged from the animal kingdom on two legs, but still with claws and fangs. So that's a very different perspective than the Buddha. And I'm not saying that the Buddha is Khalil and Dimna, but it is definitely a template. So there he is, 450 BC, telling these animal stories to his disciple. This narrative structure of the Jataka tales serves, in my opinion, as the prototype for Khalil and Dimna stories. Only some, not many, but some of the Buddha's stories continue with us on our Khalil and Dimna journey. The one that's the most widely recognized is the story of the tortoise and the two geese. And it's usually pictured with a, the two geese with a stick and the tortoise is hanging on by his beak, trying to keep quiet. So we're now going to the next stage of our trip, which is the Panchatantra. And this is the empire of Alexander the Great, as you can see. And over on the far right, this is when he invades India. With the Panchatantra, we leave the spiritual realm of a prince who gave up everything to become a Buddha. We now enter a far more secular domain where kings and princes definitely want to hang on to power. The Panchatantra means pancha, five, tantra, chapters, sections, discourses. This is the first story of how this manuscript came to exist. A hundred or so years ago, after the Buddha's death, Alexander the Great invades India. Here is the site, somewhere I just showed it to you, of his great battle in 326 BC against King Porus and his war elephants on a tributary of the Indus River in today's Pakistan. This border on the Indus is the easternmost extent of Alexander's empire. But his soldiers have been traveling for 15 years. They're tired and they're exhausted, and they want to go home and see their wives and children. And Alexander's ambition 
is beginning to thin out in the face of massive armies of Indians who have never been defeated. So Alexander and his troops rarely turn home. But he leaves behind two generals in charge of the Indus and the Punjab district. Understandably, these Greek uh, interlopers are unpopular, and they only stay in office for about 10 years, and then they all go home. One of them is replaced by a descendant of one of the local Indian kings named Dabshalim. And he turns out to be cruel and capricious. A Brahmin philosopher named Bidpai tries to teach the king moderation and justice, but Dabshalim is angry at criticism and has him thrown in jail. Then he relents and he appoints Bidpai his vizier. He carefully follows the sage's advice and within a few years, Dabshalim is adored by his subject and neighboring kings and princes come to sit at his feet and receive information about how to be a better king. Dabshalim asked Bidpai to write his teachings in a book that can be used as a guide for rulers to help them obtain the loyalty of their subjects. So the sage goes into seclusion, and within a year, he writes a book of animal stories in five chapters, the Panchatantra. Each chapter begins with a question from a king who wants to improve the quality of his rule, and the practical answer comes from the sage Bidpai, telling a complex, as Cyrus says, interwoven tapestry of different animal stories with different voices. The king tries to reward Bidpai with gifts and honors, but the sage says no, I'm an old man, I don't want that. All I would like is that you try to preserve this book and guard it. I'm going back to the pedigree. We now have outlined number one and two of the trip, the first two stages of our Kalilindim, the Jataka Tales and the Panchatantra. However, as is the way with these old manuscripts or translations, which I've been able to find, there is another version of how the Panchatantra began. 